Fundamentals Test 13, we're talking about emissions and stuff. Smog, and I'm not talking about S-A-M-U-G, smog, or A-U-G, uh, is what? It's carbon monoxide. It's ozone. What? Oh, so my first guess was you right. You serious? <laughs> oh, so I was going to put that. Okay. Well, that's according to the uh, uh, to the answer. It's actually a mixture of some things. It's not CO2. It's not carbon monoxide. You know why? We know it's not carbon monoxide, and it's not carbon dioxide, you know what? and it's not nitrogen. You know what? What? Those are all to do <laughs> Yeah, actually, um, actually, smog is uh, you know, know smog's got to do with it. smog is exhaust emission related, and it really is. I mean, and it, yeah, but it, yeah. it causes it. Yeah, but the ozone, you know, is this is a weird a this is a weird group of answers that they put on here because ozone is O3. I don't think any of that is the right answer. You know, it's not carbon monoxide because you can't see carbon monoxide and you can't smell it. The smog is visible. Who right? was tearing a hole in those? Huh? Oh, nothing, really. I mean, they were claiming chlorofluorocarbons were doing it. But, I mean, we don't use those anymore. They're, they're all gone. But every time lightning strikes, it makes ozone, you know. And, you, you know, the, you know there's chalky stuff on the inside of a distributor cap that is all, all over the contacts and you pull a distributor cap off? Yeah. It's made by ozone. Ozone is is created every time a spark pops. And whenever the all that ozone gets trapped in that distributor cap, it oxidizes that those contacts and makes them look really ugly and chalky, uh, which doesn't prevent the fire from jumping. Which gas is controlled or reduced by the exhaust gas recirculation system? NOx. NOx, oxides of nitrogen. The reason it says NO with a little X is that X can be any number. Uh, you know, you got nitrogen and you got nitrogen and oxygen compounds that are locked together in a way that they never are formed in nature at all, but in a combustion chamber that goes over what's the temperature? What's the temperature when NOx is formed? 1500. Really low. 2500. If combustion chamber temperatures during when the fire is burning in there, it goes over. If it goes over 2500 degrees, oxygen and nitrogen's in there, mm -hmm. and they're going to get locked together by that by that heat. And the catalyst helps separate those. What emission control system helps reduce the effect of engine blow-by? Positive crankcase ventilation. Now, words for the wise. Whenever you're working on one that's giving you fuel trim issues and it's kind of uh, bumping up against its adaptive limit and all that, make sure that you have the right PCV valve on there because that hole in the bottom of the PCV valve, if it's the wrong size for that particular vehicle, it can cause it to have fuel trim issues. You know what I mean? Always make sure the PCV valve is the right one for that car. Occasionally, somebody will just go to the parts house and they'll talk to a Lundy and they'll say, throw me a PCV valve and he'll throw them one they'll pop it on there and it won't be right. I will throw the right one for their vehicle. Yes. The catalytic converter, <laughs> the catalytic converter does what? Yeah, all of them. All of them. Uh, that's number four. It helps reduce NOx emissions, is located in the exhaust system. It also helps reduce hydrocarbon and carbon uh, and CO into CO H2. How does it do that, by the way? How does it take hydrocarbons and carbon monoxide and turn them into H2O and CO2. With the stuff that's inside of the catalytic converter. Yeah, that's Oh, that's a scientific yeah. answer. Well, I don't you know. know the scientific word. It's I, a catalyst. It it Thank you. To a certain degree. Huh? And it mixes. What is a catalyst? It's a catalyst. It's a By definition, what is a catalyst? It speeds up a chemical reaction or something. Huh? It speeds up a chemical reaction. Yeah, but I mean, uh, if you were going to tell me, I mean, what a catalyst, any catalyst Where is, is like. Catalyst? A catalyst is something that causes a change in other compounds without undergoing a change in itself. It doesn't change itself, but it changes other things. See what I mean? So it doesn't undergo any change uh, in its own stuff. Now, the only time that happens is if something clogs it up, you know, or if you, somebody's using leaded gasoline as if there was any of that around anymore. There is. Yeah. There was. It's difficult to come by. All right. You'd have to want to mess it up. Uh, let me see. But anyway, it's going to take and add a molecule of oxygen to hydro, I mean, to carbon monoxide. Now, what happens when you add one molecule of oxygen to carbon monoxide? It's carbon dioxide. Very good, Mr. Lundy. That's a very good answer. Okay, what happens? How many uh, molecules of oxygen do you have to add to hydrocarbons, to a molecule of hydrocarbon? 
two, two. You got to put two. You got to add two to an HC and you got to add one to a CO to make CO2. And then you get some water vapor coming out. How many gallons of water are, make, are you making for every gallon of gas you burn? One. one gallon of water per gallon of gas. That's, how, that's what you're making whenever you burn it. That's why when you crank it up in the cold wintertime, you see steam coming out the exhaust pipe and dripping on the ground. You know, it gets so big. Whenever a thing gets hot, it gets vaporized and all. That's also why there's little holes in all the mufflers so that water that settles in there can run out of there. Got it? All right. Okay, let me see. The secondary the secondary air injection system does what? All the above. It's got an air pump. Yeah. Have you ever seen an air pump? Uh, depends on what you mean by air pump. Like on a car? Like, no, like it's used for this. Okay, no. no yes, no. you have. No. You said not even think you had the same one. No, I There's one on the Bronco. Yep. Okay, never mind. Second rate amateur. You win the time, Rich. Yeah, but there's also, most of the vehicles now have got electric ones. They got an electric air pump that's about the size of an old AC con or a accumulator, and it's got a hoses coming off of it, and they go, and it makes air. Because they used to spin them with a belt, and this one not make an electric one because it doesn't use any juice to, you know, any power to pull it. I don't know how many times back in the 70s, when they first started putting air pumps on there, they'd run air, an air pipe. Uh, around both sides of the mantle, and they'd run into each exhaust runner coming out of the cylinders. There would be an air pipe in there. Now, what is that for? Now, there were valve. There was valving. You know, whenever the oxid, whenever the hydrocarbons from a cold engine are coming out of there, you know, the engine's got to run rich to, when it's running cold and all that. Let me see what Brett wants. Yeah, Brett. Mm -hmm. I've, I saw a picture of that somewhere here, and it looks like that may be what we're after. But let me call you back on that because I'm doing I'm doing a class right now. All right, All right um, let me see here. Uh, but one way or another, it pumped fresh air in there, and so that it, and it was sort of like whenever you're fanning a fire because you got these hot hydrocarbons coming out of the combustion chamber. You add some oxygen to it, then it lights off. You got it, and then you, you're helping do away with the hydrocarbons. Okay, uh, at about what temperature does oxygen combine with nitrogen to form NOx? What'd I say? 2,500. Which type of hybrid uses 30, which type of hybrid vehicle uses 36 to 42 volts? Huh? A mild hybrid. Then why did you say full? Second rate amateur. All right, which type of hybrid, huh? What? Like yeah, the full hybrids use well. It uh, up is high. It's not all. It's not the same on all of them. Um, full hybrids, you know, use up from. I've seen them. Let's see. Seem like some of them use 144. Some of them go as high as you know. Like on this, if you're driving a Ford Fusion, for example, and you hit the brake a lot, you can see the pressure, the the battery voltage go up to 600 volts sometimes, and all that. So yeah, they're they're all over the place. I mean, you get, you know, every uh, they've got a standard. Amount of cells with voltage. Okay, which type of uh, hybrid is ca capable of propelling the vehicle using just the electric motor? Thirty-six volt type. That's a full hybrid. You know, you know they had type by one, so. Yeah. <laughs> You're playing word games. The gasoline engine of a hybrid electric stops running when a vehicle stops at a traffic light. Technician A says it's normal for most hybrid electric vehicles. Technician B says there's a fault with the engine. Exactly. Oh, that's great about that. I'll tell you something about these hybrid vehicles. Whenever the motor, MG1, I guess it is, and the transaxle on the uh, Toyotas and the Fords and all, is trying to start the engine, it's spinning that engine at about 1,100 RPM, and you'll think the engine is running when it's not, okay? So also, if you're uh, changing the oil in a hybrid, you need to make sure that you follow procedures exactly so that the engine won't start up while you've got it on the lift with the uh, oil drained out of it. If you don't do it right, you know, you'll get it up on the lift, you'll drain it out. It'll say, my battery's going low, I need to start up. Oh, it just starts up arbitrarily. You know, so you, yeah. Well, on some of them you just, no, well, on some of them you just, you pull the, uh, you take the key out, you know, the little fob thing that you plug in and put it about 30 feet from the car. <laughs> I mean, it's a bunch of it. You got to look at that each particular one and say, yeah, you got to do it. But I mean, don't just plow in there and drain the oil out without, you know, making sure you're doing it right. You know, 
got to make sure it's shut down. Um, let's see. Uh, number nine, yeah, was a which type of hybrid electric design costs the least? Mild. The mild hybrid design. Have you ever? Uh, <laughs> oh, who is that? Careful. Isn't it? You know, I'm going to dance to it or not. I'm going to dance to it. He knows I'm going to dance to it. That's Snap. I'll call him back. All right. Um, let's see. Uh, how can a hybrid electric vehicle be identified? Orange electrical cables under the Both A and B. Both A and B. Emblems on the front side and rear. Right. Orange electrical cables under the hood. Throw something at you, Bobby. Well, wait a minute. What are what color are the cables on a mild hybrid? Yellow. Light blue. Yeah, on the, blue. Yeah, the ones. Yeah, they're they're, they're not. Mild. Mild. Yeah, they're mild. What routine service procedure could result in lower fuel economy, which the owner may discover? Hmm? Either A or B. Either A or B. Using the wrong viscosity oil or <coughs> replacing the tires. Yeah, of course, I don't, I mean, the tire, well, replacing the tires, if you replace them with the right ones, there's not a problem. But if you just put some tires, it'll fit, you know. You like this stuff is really tires. balanced carefully, yeah. Technician A says the first step in the diagnostic process is to verify the problem. The Technician B says the second step is to perform a thorough physical, thorough visual, visual inspection. Let me say something here, uh, see, yeah. Uh, Let's make sure when we're looking at one, everybody needs to know this too. Um, if you're working on anything that for somebody, you need to make sure that what you're working on is what they're complaining about. You got me? Because sometimes if you ain't really careful, you'll spend it, particularly when you're talking about squeaks and rattles and stuff. But if you're working on something, and are you even maybe working on the way the engine runs or something like that, and there may be something that bothers you that you notice that they weren't even talking about. And so you work for an hour and a half, two hours on something to straighten something out that that you noticed that was bothering you, and then they get in the car and they say, "That's not even what I was talking about." Wait, what? So if I notice something, don't worry about it. Yeah. I don't work on it. And I'll tell you something else that I've seen happen before. Uh, I know of a guy that went into a dealership that will remain nameless um, in this area, and he said he went in there because the car was overheating. It was trying to overheat, right? He said, my car's overheating. I need it looked at. And so it was written up for overheating. Well, the mechanic, it just so happened, liked working on those. He noticed it was skipping and cutting up, and he decided he would work on it and make it run smooth because he didn't. it bothered him a lot worse, you know, that it was skipping. And, a, and he got all caught up doing all this work on fixing it where it would run smooth, and boy, did it ever run smooth when he got through with it. And so the bill was like four hundred and fifty dollars or something, and um, the guy picked it up and he drove it. Before he got home, it overheated and burned the motor up. Because the guy got sidetracked and didn't fix what it came in there for mm. before he tried to sell more service. You see, well, the guy that put the car out, he didn't know what was being fixed. He thought, oh, okay, this is what it's going to cost to fix my overheating problem. You know. I mean, and that just, that whole thing was a train wreck. You know, the car wound up headed for the junkyard and all that. I mean, all that money was wasted and all that. But, you know, you could actually get crossed up with somebody about that. All right. Now, let's see. Uh, that's why I was looking at verifying the problem. Uh, make sure make sure you and the customer are on the same sheet of music. That's the point, right? Yeah. A global generic OBD2 scan tool is capable of displaying what? See. Hmm? Both A and B. Yeah, on most global scan tools. Um, some of them are cheap and just won't do anything except give you uh, codes, you know. Yeah, I don't think my OBD2 scan tool connects to all data. Yeah. What is the factory scan tool for General Motors vehicle? <laughs> that wasn't, I wasn't so, saying all data for the website. All I, was all I was making a joke. I was making a joke. Thank you. IBS. <laughs> huh? IBS. That's Ford. What is it? Tech two. Tech two, yeah. What is the factory scan tool for Fords? What, or IDS. IDS. 
and we have one of those. What is the factory scan tool for Chrysler Jeep? Snap on. Watch it. What do you think? Watch it. Yeah. What steps should be performed last when diagnosing an engine performance problem? Um. Let me ask you this. What step should be performed last when diagnosing and repairing any Verify. problem? Verify the repair. And what I was telling uh, Moody earlier, uh, these uh, service advisors, like if you're working in a car dealership, the service advisor wants to be the hero. He wants to be the guy that's giving them nothing but good news. All right, so let's say that you are checking this thing for some kind of power loss concern, and you've determined, because you've accurately measured the exhaust, and you can tell that you've got exhaust restriction in a catalytic converter. You know, like if you screw the oxygen sensor out, screw a fitting in there, put a hose on it, and you see the thing pegging out the gauge, you know the catalytic converter is clogged up. And you tell the guy that he's going to have to have a catalytic converter you know, before we do anything else. And their question is always going to be, is that going to fix it? Well, why do you think the shop manual says verify the repair? Now, if I know that this catalytic converter is bad, and I ain't guessing, and I'm scientific about the way I test this, you know, then I don't have any business saying, yes, I guarantee you this will fix every problem the car has and he will never even need another oil change. You know, this kind of garbage. This is stupid. You know, because they don't want to go and say, well, we're going to have to do this before we'll know if that's all of it. We know there's some of it, and we can actually show you the numbers if you want to see it. Or we see a lot of these fail or whatever. So the long and short of it is uh, the service writer has to get over that, that you cannot, I don't care who you are or how good you are, you're not going to be able to say, I guarantee you this will fix everything that the customer doesn't like about this car. <laughs> You know, and they're going to they're going to want you to tell them that so they can rub like say, "Yep, when we spend this three hundred eighty five dollars, I guarantee you we won't need anything else." <laughs> you still got to verify the repair, and something else may show up that was covered up by the first problem. That's the point. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. So basically, you're going to verify the repair. That's what verify repair is all about. Which scan tool can access detailed information on many different makes and models? Yeah, any of these can. Auto Ingenuity, Snap On, Solus, uh, OTC Genesis. Uh, and finally, number 20, Technician A says a vehicle may have stored diagnostic trouble codes even if the mill is not illuminated. Technician B says all DTCs will illuminate the mill. Yeah. Now, what do you call the code that hasn't turned on the light but it's coming? Pending. A pending code. That means that if I keep seeing problems with this. Now, what happens whenever you have a code that appears and then it doesn't appear for the next two or three days? Yeah, the code just, I mean, the light just goes off. It clears its own self. I mean, it's about, they'll figure it was some kind of an anomaly or something. Right? You got that. All right. So that pretty well winds this thing up today. We got two more. I'm sorry. Really? Oh, well, you're right. I'm sorry. I messed up. Yeah. Uh, I guess I was seeing pictures and I'm done. All right. Yeah, we're talking about gasoline direct injection here, and that's cool stuff. Boy, I sure misfired on that deal. Yeah, okay. son of a gun. Well, you know, it's messed up on that. Um, some GDI systems can fire the injector more than once per injection event. That's whether you, if you want a stratified charge or a homogeneous charge. And a stratified charge means that it fires the fuel in there pop, 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 like that and gives you a controlled burn. Uh, the homogenous charge means you just spray it in there, let it burn the old-fashioned way. Uh, GDI injector is held open with 50 to 90 volts. True. Hmm? That's oh. that sound true to you? That sound, yes. I, I remember it was a lot of volts, but I don't remember if it's 50 to 90. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a lot of volts and all that. It'll depend on which vehicle you're talking about. Uh, a late injection event may be used to heat up the catalytic converter. Oh. That would do that, wouldn't it? Yeah. Late injection would heat up the catalyst. If the catalyst needs to get hot to work and you want to heat it up, now on a GDI engine, remember what I told you, on a, on a uh, port fuel injected engine, the fuel is delivered behind the intake valve, right? So you're not going to be able to control when that gas goes in there, because it's going to go in there when the intake valve opens and not before. Now valve timing, yeah, you can do some stuff with that. But GDI, 
you can control how much, how it's injected, and when it's injected, which is a lot more precise, okay? Okay, which component of this GDI high pressure pump is the pressure regulator? B. Well, C. Well, I got B too. Oh, yeah, yeah. C. How is the pressure regulated? What regulates the pressure? The camshaft. Huh? The camshaft. No, the camshaft actually drives the pump. That's, that's what I'm thinking about. Then that's what C is, is the pump. Yeah, so, what is it? I stayed in my house, so this is going to tell me if I'm wrong. Come on, guys, you see a solenoid on there somewhere? Huh? A is a solenoid. It uses a solenoid for that. It like an injector. Well, an injector is a solenoid, but this one right here is a pressure regulator. So yeah. And this illustration shows what kind of combustion chamber? Right. Uh, 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 it's a spray guided. Uh, spray guided. <laughs> well, I don't know. I don't. Know. Why well, you it looked like it's spraying to me, sir. Well, it looked like a it looked like a swirl guided combustion chamber to me, but it could be spray guided. It could be wall guided. Which one do you think it is? I'm going to spray. Let me see. That. I know you guys read the book, didn't you? Did y'all did y'all read those chapters? No, I don't have one. You going to have one? What do you think? Cylinder head tells me it's a swirl. Yeah, so that will be spray. That'll be will be spray guided. Spray guided. Just pick one. We'll we'll see who got it right. Spray. I would say it's spray from the beginning. It looks like it's spraying. Yeah. Well, it, is, is it tumbling? I don't see a wall there. And on the, uh, the Ford uh, Tempos had high swirl combustion, but they had flat top pistons in them. Pick the one you like. Pick the one you like, we'll see if you miss it. Huh? Leave that part out and make it a mystery. All right. Pick one. You'll see that on your final exam, by the way. It's a wall. Yep.